My name is Mark, and it's my honor to share with you this episode four of Fogbound on an Icicle with my grandpa Frank and the B-47 Stratojet. Well, hey there, Skipper. Looks like you made it to this final episode of Fogbound on an Icicle, the story of my grandpa Frank, my hero. Yep, he was really quite a guy. After the Aleutians, he had proved his skills and rose through the ranks at lightning speed to be a squad commander, a lieutenant colonel, a rescue pilot, and a pilot trainer. Here's a picture of my grandma Dorothy in her 70s with Frank's fishing pictures on the wall in the background. You can see that the memory of Frank has been ever present in our lives. We will always remember him as a hero and a role model. With this Fogbound series, we have uncovered some of the secrets and specifics that back up his story, which had previously been rotting away in an old shoebox as the photos were literally disintegrating. Rescuing his story like a downed airman and preserving it once more for history. In this episode, we're gonna cover everything from his life after the Aleutians to his fateful final flight. So make sure you got your seat belts buckled, because here we go. When Frank returned home from the Aleutian Islands campaign, he was already a hero. He got right to work on making a bunch of kids. There would be five kids altogether. However, he was still on active duty and World War II was ongoing in the Pacific. So he would only be home long enough for a few days of pleasant stuff, and then he'd be back on another assignment. He was so busy with his duties in the Air Force that he would not be present for any of his children's births. As Grandma Dorothy remembers him saying, I was there when the key was laid. I don't have to be there for the ignition. Well, you didn't have to be there when the... When the keel was laid. You were there when the keel was laid. You didn't have to be there for the launching. (laughs) (laughs) He had a funny sense of humor like that. I can't really verify much of what happened after the Aleutians because there is so little evidence. However, if you remember in the last episode, he had said, I hope they ship me off to the South Pacific. Well, it looks like he got his wish because there is at least this one photo of him at General Kuribayashi's cave on Iwo Jima, which would make sense because after Midway in the Aleutians, the rest of the job in the Pacific was to push the Japanese all the way back to Japan until they admitted defeat. You may have heard of Iwo Jima. It was a fierce battle. It's interesting to think that Frank was there, even if only as a transport pilot, That would place him at at least two of the most important battles in the Pacific Theater. After that, there's only snippets about his missions. B-24 exhibition given for combat crews. Test pilot shows the capability of the ship. A B-24 demonstration was given above Goan Field Monday to show combat crews, particularly the incoming crews, the capabilities of a B-24. The exhibition is a policy of the 4th Air Force to incite confidence of the crews in the performance of the B-24. The announcer was Captain Frank Razor, a Lucian veteran. Mr. Bill Roberts who flew the ship has been a test pilot for the corporation for two years. The demonstration included a short field takeoff, turns with one, two, and three feathered engines, a lazy eight, a left chandel attaining almost perpendicular pitch, and a landing with two engines dead on one side. Air rescuers like their work. 
Aiding down or lost flyers is a real thrill. Members of Detachment 8 Air Rescue Service at McCord Field are convinced that their outfit has the most soul-satisfying work in the Army Air Forces. The unit of 49 officers and men has the job of finding planes that have gone down in Washington and Oregon. Beyond the proximity of air bases, and bringing rescue to survivors. Every man knows that a life may depend on his efficiency, and according to Major Frank Razor, a tall young Texan who is the detachment's commander, it is with the spirit and teamwork of a football team that the detachment goes into action when an alert plane overdue sounds over the loudspeakers. If every pilot would only file a flight plan, moaned Lieutenant J.J. Miller, Senior Search Controller. There is no law requiring a civilian pilot to file a flight plan, and sometimes days are lost before anyone at all knows he is missing. Even then, we don't know where to begin a search until we find out from maybe the last person to whom he talked at the airport, from his parents, from someone what his intentions were, what route he planned to take, what fuel he had, and then we must check back on what weather he encountered to try to guess where he would go and check all the little airfields around, lest he may have landed somewhere without notifying anyone. During the past year, the detachment has sought 32 down planes. The unit has three B-17s equipped with special domed search windows, two C-47 transports fitted with rescue material to be dropped from the air. The search usually is made by B-17s, according to Lieutenant Harry Pape, personnel equipment officer. The group has packs ready with everything needed for living in the open, mountain climbing, and rescue work. There are even two snow weasels and two radio jeeps ready to wheel on the transports. There is excitement in the altitudes at which we work, sometimes 50 feet above the ground, reported Master Sergeant Melvin R. Hersey, line chief of the detachment. Something like ground strafing, and I don't know any thrill like that of seeing the smile on some poor, tired fellow's face when the rescue team walks in. Major Razor had that happen to him just a few weeks ago. Four of the down plane's crew were dead, but two men lived to greet the rescue party which climbed five miles over mountain slopes to reach them. That's the thrill, grinned the 29-year-old commander. Frank's Letters to Dorothy, February 6th. 1951, Columbia University, New York. Dear wife, I miss you and the kids. I don't know why, but I do. As you can see by the enclosed clippings, I have gotten myself involved in a big deal. So for me, I've done nothing but have roundtable discussions with the brains. I must say this is very top as far as really educated people go. I don't exactly know what our jobs are yet, but I suspect that these big shots have hit a snag in the citizenship program and want us to come up with a solution. As you might expect, I caught a beautiful cold. Yesterday, I was sure I was going to die. Today, I am sure I am too sick to die. My nose and my eyes are running. I am down to my last hanky, and every bone in my body hurts. I'm taking aspirins and nose drops by the tons. Tomorrow, we are scheduled to make a field trip to New Jersey, 30 miles away, to visit a high school that has a citizenship program in operations. If I don't feel better, I'm going to stay in bed all day. In fact, I may never get up. How are you and the troops? Right soon. Love, Frank. This letter is important because it suggests that he may have been involved in high-level military intelligence programs, 
I believe that the citizenship program he refers to is what became known as the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, also known as the McCarran-Walter Act. It was meant to safeguard the country from communism and undesirable immigrants. Later in life, he was offered an exciting but dangerous assignment. Grandma said he accepted the assignment because she told him, Honey, I know flying is what you do, and I can't keep you from that. I don't want to scare you. There's nothing mysterious about the B-47. It's a good plan, a safe plan, provided you know what you're doing at all times. It has some new features you're probably not familiar with. Features that will present you with some new problems. To let you meet the B-47 and get you familiar with some of these differences, well, let's go back a little in time. As you all know, in the evolution of weapons, instruments of offense and defense are continuously competing for superiority. You build a tank, then you develop an anti-tank gun. You build a bomber for offense, then a better fighter for defense. If it happens to be a jet fighter, then the logical next move is to produce a jet bomber, but quick. Well, that was about the situation in June, I think it was. June of 1943. The Nazis were putting jet fighters into combat. So our need for a jet bomber was clear. An aircraft to be built around an engine. It would have to have speed. More speed than was ever thought possible for a bomber before. It needed altitude. The higher, the better. It had to have range. That was a sore spot, too. Captured Nazi research data revealed that the Germans had developed a radical wing design, the swept wing. The plans indicated that the wing could withstand extremely high speeds. Wind tunnel tests confirmed this fact, but it also revealed some sobering problems of sweep back. By increasing the angle of sweep, you can increase the critical speed of the airfoil. But, as you increase the angle of sweep, you decrease the span. Since the range of any airfoil is a function of span, they had to compromise to get the maximum of both speed and range. The wind tunnel and slide rule discovered problems of lateral control at the lower air speeds caused by the tendency of the outer portion of the swept wing to stall first. So the problems of lateral control were reduced by designing large aileron and flap areas. When the outboard engine nacelle was added, the problems of lateral control were further reduced. Here engineers discovered some disadvantages of the swept wing, like additional weight for wing structure, tough problems of lateral control at low air speeds, longer takeoff and landing rolls due to the necessary high speeds but the speed potential of a swept wing was worth accepting the disadvantages. A bomber designed to have a margin of performance over all other aircraft. An offensive flying machine designed to aggravate the interception problem of fighters and frustrate every possible defense for years to come. It didn't take long to realize that we had the offensive weapon we ordered, that the Air Force had become landlord of the fastest bomber in the world. The B-47 was a highly classified aircraft at the time. This plane was so top secret that if it was being tested today, it would be tested at a top secret facility like Area 51. However, this was before Area 51 existed. The B-47 had a critical design flaw. Very poor lift due to the severe angle of the swept wing. And the materials used were the same type of materials they used on the old World War II planes, on the propeller-driven airplanes, and so the metal used was not really up to snuff for the capacity of jet engines. Jet crash kills four at Barksdale. 
burns after takeoff in first B-47 bomber crack-up for base. Four Barksdale Air Force base men were killed instantly at 9.45 a.m. yesterday when a B-47 Stratojet bomber crashed and burned only seconds after takeoff from the base's main runway. Barksdale officials identified the dead, three flight officers and one airman, as William, 35, the aircraft commander, Frank Razor, 37, the pilot, Robert, 38, the observer, and Richard, 22, the crew chief. Witnesses to the fatal crash said the bomber made a normal takeoff, leaving the ground by the time it was halfway down the runway. It climbed to about 500 feet, leveled off, and suddenly banked steeply to the right and plummeted earthward, plowing into the ground, nose and right wing first. The six-engine jet bomber attached to the 301st bomb wing exploded when it hit the ground. Wreckage was strewn over a 200-yard area. Within 45 minutes after the crash, the bodies of the four men, reportedly still strapped to their seats by safety belts, were removed from the blazing center section of the aircraft. The first body was taken from the aircraft within 10 minutes. The aircraft crashed short of the taxi strip about 300 yards west of the main runway. The cause of the crash was unknown, and an investigation is being made to determine why the big bomber crashed to the earth. One spokesman said the plane apparently lost its airspeed for some unknown reason, likely having something to do with the type's notoriously slow and unpredictable spool-up of its jet engines. Base firemen battled the blaze for about an hour before extinguishing it, and one fireman was hospitalized at the base when he was overcome with smoke. Lieutenant Colonel Razor, the pilot and also squadron commander of the 353rd, resided at 400 Barksdale Boulevard on the base. He is survived by his widow, Miss Dorothy E. Razor, and five children. He is also survived by his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Ernest M. Razor of San Antonio, Texas. They could hear the explosion in the housing on the base. It shook the ground like an earthquake. Grandma must have known something was wrong because she told Joan and Candace to take the two boys upstairs and pray. Joan was trying to corral the boys. Candace didn't want to go upstairs. She wanted to stay downstairs and see what was happening. Roberta was just a baby sleeping in the cradle. Yep, so now you know, that's what happened to my Grandpa Frank. He died a hero in the line of duty. Now I want to be clear about something, guys. The B-47 crash was not futile. It was a totally necessary step in the development of jet aircraft. The B-47 is an important aircraft in history because it was basically the precursor to all of today's modern commercial jet aircraft and military bombers. That basic design of a long tube fuselage and four jets on the wings came from the B-47. So I think that's pretty special. If you have ever traveled in a commercial jet, well, my grandpa helped to make that possible. So next time you're outside and you hear the roar of the jet engines in the sky, you can think, there goes Frank. So thank you, Grandpa Frank. He bought us our freedoms with his life and helped our country more than you'll ever realize. Every little thing that's been nice in your life in this country, yeah, there's some problems here and there, but for the most part, our life has been great in this country. And it was my grandpa and men like him that bought those freedoms for us. Frank had five kids, Joan, Candace, Richard, Frank, and Roberta. All of his kids got put through college with Frank's military insurance package. 
The boys, Richard and Frank, are lifelong fishing fanatics just like their father. I am the son of the youngest, Roberta, and I got the fishing bug too. See these early pictures of me fishing and practicing archery just like a little copy of Frank. Richard's son, Nick, joined the National Guard and carries on Frank's military spirit. So Frank's legacy lives on. Thank you, Grandpa Frank. You'll always be young and larger than life and a hero to all of us. P.S. If you haven't already heard, Frank is now Googleable and officially part of history on the National Park's website. See the link in the description below. Please stay tuned for future installments. Until then, your orders are to maintain your attitude, and we'll see you there. Mark out.